the sport of football has changed dramatically over the years. From the world's first international fixture in 1872 when England played with eight forwards, to the 2012 European Championships in which Spain played without a single one. The sport has moulded and adapted with new rules, philosophies and understandings over the years. At least once a decade there tends to be a significant tactical shift, and more often than not that comes with a change to the way in which a certain role is played. The vast majority of the time, these changes happen gradually and due to a multitude of factors, but every now and then, there are individuals who can dramatically move the sport on their own. It is these individuals who are the focus of this seven, and specifically, those who had an enormous impact on a specific position, whether that be through creating a new position or majorly altering the way in which an existing position is played. My thanks go to Ambient Bird who said in this idea, which I was convinced I'd already done, but a quick search would suggest that I have not. That serves as a reminder that if you do have any video ideas or suggestions, do not hesitate to leave them in the comments or fire them over to me on Twitter. As a case in point, in December, Lennart sent in the seven national teams overloaded in one position video idea, which has since had over a million views, so I do really appreciate your suggestions. Right, here are my seven footballers who revolutionised their positions, and there will be some honourable mentions between first and second place. Lev Yashin it is a happy coincidence that we start this seven with a goalkeeper, and I regret to inform you that it won't be followed by defenders and midfielders, finishing with a centre forward in top spot. It's all well and good having an idea of how a position ought to be played, but if you can't properly execute your ideas, they're unlikely to take off. Thankfully in the case of Lev Yashin, he was not just a visionary, but also a magnificent goalkeeper. The fundamentals of goalkeeping, which are essentially keeping the ball out of your net, have never changed. Yashin possessed first-class reflexes, agility and handling, and he would have gone down as an excellent keeper, even if he had just stuck to the basics. Instead, however, he revolutionised at the very least the European game at a time when European goalkeepers would almost never venture more than a couple of yards from their goal line. Yashin was far more authoritative. He wouldn't hesitate to come out and meet a cross, order his back line, or rush out to meet a centre forward had the last man been beaten. He massively expanded the scope of what a goalkeeper could do, not just in terms of guarding his own goal, but also with his fast and accurate distribution. Yashin is widely regarded as the greatest goalkeeper of all time, but he is also among the most influential. Nandor Hidakuti If you're someone with an interest in the history of football like me, you will have lost count of the number of people who are labelled as the first withdrawn forward, second striker, or more recently, false nine. Nandor Hidaguti is a man sometimes traipsed with that label, but he most assuredly was not the first footballer to play that role. He was, however, among the most effective, and he played it with an intelligence rarely witnessed before or since. Hidaguti starred for Hungary during their golden generation between the late 1940s and mid-1950s. He wasn't Hungary's best player, the likes of Ferenc Puskas and Josef Bozsik would be more deserving of that title, but he was arguably their most important. Stop Hidaguti, the theory went, and you could stop Hungary. The only problem was, few could get near him. The genius of Hidaguti was his ability to drag players wildly out of position and punishing them either when he received the ball or through Hungary bypassing him altogether and taking advantage of the space he had created. In the 1953 game of the century, Hidaguti was the mastermind of England's 6 3 demise, and in the 1954 World Cup, Germany manager Sepp Herberger gave Horst Eckel the sole responsibility of marking Hidaguti all game. Herberger didn't want any of his defence being dragged around by Hidaguti, so he sacrificed a midfielder for the full 90 minutes. West Germany won the game 3 2, the only defeat Hungary suffered in four years. Amadio Carrizo. The most influential goalkeepers of all time are undoubtedly Lev Yashin and Amadio Carrizo, and they left their marks in football's two biggest regions. Yashin redefined European goalkeeping, meanwhile Carrizo did so even more exuberantly during roughly the same era in South America. Amadio Carrizo made his debut in 1945, five years before Yashin, for the giants of Buenos Aires that are River Plate. He's credited with pioneering a number of aspects of goalkeeping, whether that be the first goalkeeper to wear gloves, the first to use goal kicks to launch counter-attacks, or the first to venture well beyond his six-yard box. Carrizo practically invented the El Loco style of South American goalkeeping, and it is only because the world was a much smaller place in the 1940s and 50s that it wasn't until Lev Yashin came along with the Soviet Union that his ideas spread to Europe. Carrizo won 20 caps for Argentina, but is best remembered for his 23-year association with River Plate, where he remains the club's all-time leading appearance holder. 
We have Carrizo to thank for the great El Loco goalkeepers like Jose Luis Chilavert or Rene Aguita who followed, right up to the present day with the likes of Alison Becker and Edison. Here is a photo of Carrizo and Yashin together from 1969, and this is how well he looked back in August 2016, age 90. Carrizo is still alive now, age 93, and we'd like to thank him for his services to this great sport. Bill McCracken it tends to be a good indication that you've mastered your position when the footballing authorities come along and say you've got a bit too good and they're going to have to change the rules. That's exactly what happened with Bill McCracken, who spent his entire club career with Newcastle United between 1904 and 1924. The offside rule at the time dictated that there be three opposition players or more between yourself and the goal line in order to render a forward onside. And through Kraken, Newcastle pioneered a way in which to make it next to impossible for forwards not to be caught offside. Many teams followed in their footsteps, and in 1925, football's governing bodies voted in favour of reducing the number of defensive players required to put a four-player in offside position from three to two. That would be a bit like FIFA in the 1960s saying, well, hold on now, Pele, you're getting a bit good at this scoring lark. We've decided to half the size of the goal and play with the medicine ball. McCracken revolutionised defending during his time and the entire sport through the prompting of a rule change long term. He retired from playing in 1924 and from management in 1950, but continued working as a scout into his 90s. McCracken is Hull City's second longest serving manager of all time, and oddly enough, he apparently died in Hull at the age of 95. I say oddly enough because it wasn't Kingston upon Hull, but rather Hull, the central business district in Quebec, Canada. Franz Beckenbauer the sweeper or libero position is an unusual one, since it's sometimes credited with being invented by Franz Beckenbauer in the 1970s or Armando Picchi in the 1960s, but in truth, it's actually much older than that. The role of a sweeper is very similar to the original role of the centre-half up until the late 1940s and early 1950s, when the position became much more similar to the modern-day centre-back. The centre-half, sweeper or libero is primarily a defender, but you can think of them as more of a forward-thinking and active defender. Whilst a centre-back is primarily a reactive player, responding to the actions of a centre-forward and looking to thwart their attacking intent, the centre-half or sweeper plays their own game, doesn't stick to a player, and looks to instigate attacks when they get the ball. Some people like to think of it as a mix of the centre-back and defensive midfield positions, and many of the best sweepers over the years have been former midfielders. That is the case with Franz Beckenbauer, who played in central midfield for West Germany as they reached the final of the 1966 World Cup, but had become a sweeper by the time they won the tournament in 1974. The more inventive style of defender was dying out when Beckenbauer came onto the scene, hence giving the impression that it was a new position. It might not have been totally new, but it had never been so spectacular. No player had ever played the position with such elegance, intelligence or incision, and no player has since. Beckenbauer inspired a generation of sweepers, but you don't see many out-and-out -out sweepers nowadays. They have been replaced by ball-playing centre-backs, who are rather confusingly almost a hybrid between the cloggers of old-school centre-backs and the even older centre-halves. Matthias Sindelar As I said when talking about Nandar Haidekuti, trying to find the world's first withdrawn forward is like trying to find the world's oldest grain of sand. It can't be done, and you'll waste a lot of time trying. It is my personal opinion that Matthias Sindelar was the world's first truly world-class withdrawn forward though, and without doubt the most influential. Nicknamed the Paper Man for his slight build, Sindelar came along at a time when football was again built around raw strength and pace. In the midst of all this, the diminutive Austrian, standing at 5 foot 9 inches tall and as wide as a rake, was redefining not just a position, but the entire idea of how a footballer ought to look and play. Sindelar was an artist, hailed as the Mozart of football in the coffee houses of Vienna. His flair and intelligence drew crowds from far afield, with some bringing pens and paper to take note of how he was so effective. Sindelar spent his entire career with Austria Vienna, and scored 26 goals in 43 caps for Austria. He had a lifelong battle with fascism, and after Germany annexed Austria, he refused to represent the German national team. In 1939, age 35, he and his girlfriend were found dead in their apartment, with the cause being put down as carbon monoxide poisoning. It has long been suspected that the Nazis played a part in Sindelar's death, but his legacy to the sport, we all know and love, lives on more than 80 years since his passing. Honourable Mentions This is not so much a set of honourable mentions as it is an explanation, since I suspect there is one name that will crop up a lot in the comments. How could you forget Claude Makélélé? He literally had a position named after him, you idiot. No, I did not forget Claude Makélélé. 
Yes, he does have a position named after him. And yes, he did have a profound impact on football. People who think Makaleli somehow invented the so-called Makaleli role are badly mistaken. I can assure you that there were players acting as shields in front of a backline for more than a century before Makaleli. Makaleli's legacy as groundbreaking is focused almost solely in England, where box-to-box -box midfielders were the flavour of the month and most teams were still playing 4-4-2. In this environment, Makaleli seemed like some kind of alien, sitting in the Chelsea midfield and immediately making them the best defensive unit in the division. Outside of the Premier League, Makaleli was just an excellent defensive midfielder. He deserves an honourable mention for his impact here in England, but I couldn't justify a top 7 place. Other players I could have mentioned include Carlos Valante, who played the so-called Makaleli role in the 1920s and 30s and, similarly to Makaleli, that position is named after him in Brazil. Jose Andrade, who is perhaps the greatest defensive midfielder of all time and showed how a holding player could truly dictate a game and be among the best players on earth, and Manuel Neuer, who hasn't necessarily done anything brand new but has massively brought the sweeper keeper role back into prominence to the extent which we are starting to see now. Those are some of my honourable mentions, I'd love to hear your suggestions in the comments, but before that, here is my top spot. Nilton Santos there are a few reasons why I feel Nilton Santos deserves to top this seven. Every player I've talked about in this video has an enormous legacy which others have built, adapted or expanded upon, but none has stayed as true to the ideals of the player who pioneered the position as the role of fullback has with regards to Nilton Santos. As some of you may know, the role of fullback used to refer to the two deepest players on a team, essentially the only two defenders. Then came the back three, in which the fullbacks were joined by a centre half, and finally the back four in which the two fullbacks had two centre-halves or centre-backs alongside them. As such, the fullback has traditionally been the most defensive position on a football pitch. Even when centre-halves came along, they were often more attacking than the fullbacks. That may seem alien to us now, but it's quite possible that it would still be the case were it not for pioneers like Nilton Santos. When Brazil took to the 1958 World Cup, they played with what might erroneously be described as a flat back four. But it wasn't flat, as the two centre-backs stayed deep, but the two full-backs were given licence to support the attack. Take nothing away from Jalma Santos, who is one of the all-time great right-backs, but Nilton Santos was the one who just kept on smashing down walls at what full-backs could do. That has been expanded upon for generation upon generation since Santos retired, with full-backs now often being converted wings, something that would have been unthinkable in the 1950s or 60s. Before his death in 2013, Santos said he didn't envy the footballers of the 21st century for the money that they earn, just the extraordinary license that they are given to go and attack. Similarly to how Carrizo pioneered in South America followed by Yashin in Europe, an honourable mention ought to go to Jacinto Fichetti, who had a similar impact to Santos in the European game. That's it for today's video. Thank you for watching, feel free to give the video a like if you enjoyed it, in fact please do, and make sure you're subscribed to HITC7s, oh, and head over to www.englandsgreatestdefender.com to have your mind blown by the best football book ever written.